Bonsoir, uh, good night, uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, El, uh, for being here for the for the second night. Um, I propose that we kick off the conversation in English. But uh, if you have any questions in English or in French, please do interrupt us. Please uh, join us. I think you can perhaps start with situating this film within the body of your work and particularly in relation to one of the main threads I think in your work which is the dynamics between uh, obedience, blindness and uh, justification. Uh, yesterday we saw uh, Iskwar uh, which deals with uh, the instrumentalization of collective memory as a source of uh, justification and I think before this film you made a film called uh, The Specialist which examines the role of, uh, of Eichmann, Adolf Eichmann, as a kind of cog with, within the Nazi machinery. And this film is based on, on the testimony of perhaps another specialist, another expert, who sees and, and perhaps justifies himself as a, a cog in a system that is not of his making, not of his own making. Um, so c can you tell us something about how this concern with the logic of justification has developed and how is it, it has evolved in your work? I love, I love listening to you, Stoff. It's, it's true. Um, it's a difficult and it's a very, I, I think that it's the fundamental uh, question, which is a shift, um, fortunately, I would say, quite early in my work. I mean, I started as, um, I would say, a classical white documentary filmmaker, uh, which means interested by the other, going to the exotic place, looking for the different, and believing honestly that my tool of cinema is a platform that can allow to the subaltarian, to the other, uh, to speak. But in a very early stage, I, uh, uh, I would say, after my first film, because of a political context, I started to develop a critique on documentary practice, so this is the classical documentary practice, and started to think about the question of the absence of a figure from the documentary practice, which is the perpetrator, the bourreau. Um, not the perpetrator as the opposition to the victim in a certain way, but I started to be interested, and this relates to the film of yesterday's course, Slaves of Memory, which was done during the first Palestinian uprising in uh, the first Intifada in the, in the 90s, which was how memory or how collective memory, in the case of the film that was sent yesterday, becomes what I defined much later as a regime of justification. How a regime of justification become permissive. And in a certain way, I mean, all the practice, all my documentary practice shifted into this question of how, in fact, to voice and to listen to this figure that we are not usually listening in the documentary, which is the perpetrator, but through the regime of justification. And I would say, in order to make a long story short, that what I discover in this long research that it's still uh, what I'm interested in working on, which is this idea of framing perpetrator, is to see that the regime of justification that perpetrators are using, which would be obedience, well-working, um, uh, uh, I'm just a drop on the oceans. I mean, we can, we can have patterns of justification. And what's is interesting is that there are transcultural, transcontextual, transgeographical, um, uh, transpolitical in a certain way, which is the reason a typology of the perpetrator. And I will conclude as a very, very contemporary, permanent contemporary figure. I mean, I didn't see this film many, many years. I remember why we did it at the moment, at the time, but when I'm listening to the way that he's speaking, but even people like the mayor of uh, uh, Berlin at the time that is speaking for the people, I mean, he's speaking, they are speaking in a language that we hear almost every day in the media. 
which is, it's also the persistence of the regime of justification, which I'm interested in, which I believe that obedience is in fact a result of it. The obedience doesn't come first and then the regime of justification. I would say that regime of justification of perpetrators is a posteriori during the act, I mean a priori during the act and a posteriori. It what allows to commit political crime, if we take this example, but we could take uh, uh, domestic violence, and it would justify it a posteriori. I hope that I answered. Well, you're right that one of the main challenges in your work, that your work faces, but also presents to us, is this figure, this figure of the perpetrator, as opposed to the victim, the victim figure as, as a witness, uh, who is still very common in the documentary practices, even, uh, even today. But the paradox, of course, is that um, a figure like Major B in, in this film sees and presents himself more as a, as a victim. Uh, so how do you conceive cinema then as a kind of critical lens to pierce through this Pontius Pilatus uh, self-image? Well, I think that this is this is uh, something which is extremely uh, um, uh, typical to uh, I would say the regime the regime of justification a posteriori of of a perpetrator, which is I'm in fact a victim, but this is what allows also to commit the crime, which is we are under a threat from the outside, which means we are potential victims also, and this is permissive. I mean, the idea that victims can become perpetrators or that victims in a way have a permissivity of perpetrators, this is something that we know well from, I would say, psychology or when we come and we, uh, 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 we start to interrogate um, abused uh, uh, children, uh, abusers of children, we will discover that they are victims in a certain way of this abuse and it is a return. So, of course, what I'm doing is an analogy which might be tricky, which is can we think in a term of nation, of a collective, also of this idea of being victim, which goes, by the way, together with being hero, because those are victims of fascism, I mean, of national socialism before they are victims though are the victims but these are also the resistance it's the big part of the communist resistance against the fascist regime so it's both an idea of being a victim and a hero which are in fact figures of memory they are not figures of the reality i would say they are figures of cinema and figures of memory i mean there is no nation no collective which is only victim only perpetrate. This is a question of a context. What the reason, the regime of justification, it's a decontextualization. Two victim figures are playing inside B. It's to be the victim of this threat of the West and the permanent, of the reaction, of the counter-revolution, of capitalism, this is one, and the other is the idea that the sacrifice for, for the state is a position of victim. And then there is the reality. There is the reality that the people that were in the core of the state in a certain way, that were not the margins, that were the center, will be, they were, they were the extreme centrist or radical uh, centrist of the regime, become in fact, the underdogs, after what certain, certain people that work with me, it's most people from the East, qualified as the colonization by the West, which in the West was called reunification. And I think that these two visions are very uh, strong. So the, the feeling of, in fact, we can still be useful also in the new uh, state, but we are paying the price. And indeed, I mean, those civil servants, in a certain way, paid a price that other didn't. Well, this, this preoccupation with victimhood, and especially well, German victimhood, was already observed by uh, Hannah Arendt, of course, of course. but uh, has in a way become more common, uh, in particular after the reunification. What is your take on, on, on this relation between victimhood and, and a sense of nationalism? Uh, I, I, I think that if we, if, if we look in history, if history of nations, I mean, let's let's take a, a current example of the current uh, 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 
current uh, politics, which is the smarter, uh, the smarter uh, nation, which is which are the Kurds. Which this is this is also the the vision of the West about the smarter uh, uh, nation, or na uh, and in the same time, this is the deep conscience of the Kurds. When there is memory, I said it yesterday, but when there is the memory, there is obli oblivion. I mean, it's memory, it's oblivion. Or Goethe was saying this beautiful sentence, which is when I hear the word memory, I wonder what was forgotten. So if we take the example of the Kurds, one of the things that doesn't exist in the collective conscience of the Kurds themselves is the fact that they were the perpetrator in the name of the Kurdish of the Armenian genocide. But we can look at it also in nations like Serbia, that used the memory in a certain moment, the memory of victimhood in order to justify the fact of being perpetrated. We have it also in Burundi and other places. So, in fact, I, I won't say that it's the question of the, the question of the regime of justification and nationalism, but it is exactly how victimhood plays the role of a permissive, a permission to act. The idea that a victim is a victim is innocent, always innocent, this is something that Arendt dismisses, Hannah Arendt dismisses, when she is saying a Jewish raper, rapist, raper, rapist, raper, raper, rapist, he is innocent in front of the gas chamber, but only in front of the gas chamber, which is, it's a context, the innocency, the victimhood or the perpetuation, it's a context. It's not a genetic, it's not an heritage, it's not, and this is the thing that the Israelis, I mean, and the Israeli now, and the connection between it's the sensitivity to this, a regime of justification that works on, on victimhood, which is if we were a victim, we are a victim, we will be a victim. It means that all what we are doing is self defense, in fact. Uh, and, okay, what? Well, Major B, uh, he's perhaps another embodiment of this uh, banality of evil that uh, Arendt wrote about in relation to Eichmann. But uh, I think here it becomes more explicit that that uh, Major B um, really identifies himself with the kind of belief, belief system that is offered to him uh, by the regime. And I think this question of belief and belief systems is something quite urgent nowadays, not, now that we're more and more perhaps overwhelmed by ideological, identitary uh, belief, system, belief systems. And the question that many of us are dealing with, uh, how to create perhaps a counter-belief, uh, a kind of, how, what can we still believe in that goes against those dominant uh, models? Uh, what, what, how does belief arise? Uh, well, I think there is something which is, I, you, you, you're talking about belief, I was wondering about question of belief, I would like to add to it something which is the notion of love. Um, there is something which, and why I'm saying it, because there is something in B, in major B, which is a kind of, you know, following this popular idea, the love is blind or create blindness. I mean, the, the love of the ideal uh, creates a kind of a blindness on reality. And I think that this is, this is why I'm putting the collection with love and, and, and belief. I think that the belief that you're talking about, or anyone, the one that I'm understanding, is this belief that disconnect from the real, disconnect from the reality, which which allows, in fact, to come and say, I mean, this B represents the love of certain, um, I would say, entrepreneur, startupists, etc., to the idea of capitalism itself. And he is being, there is somebody that betrays, the last sentence maybe of B is the fundamental, despite everything, he says, whatsoever we will leave others to betray our ideals. The problem, I think, that B is pointing out is what happened when the ideals or the belief in this race creates a pre-image. There is the sentence which I'm always surprised to hear again and again in the film when I'm watching it, which is, these are not the people. This what we did. We didn't prepare to that. I mean, they did. There was a pre-image coming from the belief 
The belief creates an image which is how we look the counter-revolution. What is the people? What is the, the, uh, the demonstration against the regime? And then the moment that it comes, it doesn't correspond to the pre-image, which means this is what I'm talking about, this disconnection of reality that I think that we see today. I mean, we see today that I saw the repression on the film and I was saying to myself, well, the Parisian repression of the Gilets Jaunes was much harder, in fact. I mean, it's a, it's a, eh, the idea, this idea of the surveillance, but what's the ideal? What is this belief which is uh, behind? And this, this belief, it's the sublime belief, it's the belief in the belief itself. And this is our problem. It's the belief in the belief itself. It's not in the content of the belief. It's indeed a, f a film about blind love. And what is striking yeah. that uh, the Stasi who controlled, monitored everything and, and everyone. Nothing. And saw nothing. Remained, well, remained blind for the movements that were, that were happening. Yeah. Yeah. But this is also, I think, that in a certain way, this is the other side of the film that we were interested in, which is a question of cinema itself. Mm. I mean, what happens with that fact of accumulation of image? I mean, is the accumulation of image, which are based on the idea of the representation itself, which doesn't go beyond representation, in fact, doesn't create a kind of a blindness. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were so many images. Everything was recorded. I mean, we're talking about 300,000 people working what was called e-formal collaborator, basically one in each family, if you, think, uh, if you think about it. Total, and in the same time, the thing that they wanted to see, they didn't see. Mm. The thing that they wanted to see exactly, which is the counter-revolution, they saw everything beside the thing that they were looking for. And this is something in a certain way that, that brings for, for, for a subject which is current every day, which is, for example, the relation that there is today to the terrain of war through the drones, for example, through the image. I mean, what there is, it's not looking anymore at the terrain, but it look at the pos potentiality that in this terrain there are terrorists. So in that moment you bomb. And, uh, and if you see, even if you see a car stopping and somebody moving with an umbrella, so obviously it's a gun, because it was decided in advance that this image will show something. This would happen with the Stasi. I mean, they were shooting all those images, which is almost unbearable to see. They were not images, they were projections. And I think that this is the blindness. The blindness is when you start to project on the reality, not what the reason the reality, but what you see in the reality. Uh, we're talking about a blindness at the heart of vision, eh? a vision which is associated with control. And of course, this reminds us of uh, Faroki, especially uh, images of the world. Um, but can you tell me how this notion of blindness, of, of blind, no, blind love, mm -hmm. has informed the way you uh, conceptualized and especially constructed the film? Uh, it, uh, what, what, you, what you decided to show and, and, and to not show, to hide? Well, the first thing that is hidden is B himself. Um, he appears no in no. There is no a single moment when you see him in the film. There is a hint in the very end with the man that passes in the frame and go back home in the night, but it's really a shadow. So first of all, B is outside, and it's his testimony, his his entire testimony. I think that the thing that it is, I hope, that it's a sign, it's the ability of the spectator to define the source of the image. Is it surveillance image? Is it fiction image? Is it contemporary image? Is it art? What, what, what kind of image there is there? And this is something which is not given as a text in the film. There is no, I believe, way to look at it. There are all those sources that I was talking, but there is amateur cinema. Amateur cinema by people living in the East. We published a newspaper in former East Germany, people that have amateur or home, what were called home movies. So you have home movies and you have police. And you have, of course, Stasi. But inside the Stasi material, there is material which is reenactments, in fact, as films of uh, instruction. So, uh, and I think that this, this idea of 
that this what 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 we tried in the edit, which is two things, which is to break the question of time. The film start contemporary of the time, two thousand four. George Bush, uh, uh, Tony Blair, Aznar. You have all those uh, people speaking about security and civilians. I mean, the same kind of discourse. It's to blur the time. There is even one moment. Maybe some notice that there are monitors that, in fact, it's written 2013. Which is, in fact, it's the shooting itself. It was 11 11 2013, was the shooting in the building of, of the Stasi. But there is, I mean, this, this is the, the recognition of the image, the fact is it, and also to try to create a kind of an image which looks at you which is the, the idea, but in fact, not only in here, which is to raise this question, and this is, this is maybe the, the answer, which is what, in fact, I'm given to see. It's not what there is there, but what I'm given to see. I mean, how, how I'm being played with by the director as a spectator, which is how you start to make an active work of trying to understand what's going Well, you have this discourse about the work, about the dossier, the thing. You don't know, does he walk there? Is it him? Is it the building before? Is it the archive? I mean, this blaring of time, which is for me important because what I said in the beginning, because this trans cultural, trans, uh, 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 trans contextual, and, and, and periodically, that the persistence of the discourse on surveillance and protection, it's a discourse that. that in a way, maybe the DDR arrived to the climax. I mean, Facebook, drones, uh, surveillance through iPhone. I mean, this is byproducts of maybe this one, which is the illusion of the possibility of surveying everything. And they were drawn in two things. They were drawn in the fact that they didn't see in the image what they were looking for, but also in the amount of data. When you think of it, most of the images that we get to see in, in this film don't actually show anything. Exactly. I mean, not anything meaningful in and of themselves. So the, the attention is displaced or sh is shifts in a certain way to the, to the gesture, to the intention of surveying, of, of monitoring, of capturing reality as, as much as possible. So there was really a, a conscious choice of you to, to not focus on the so-called objectivity of surveillance, but really on the subjective. No, because one of the things that, 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 the thing that I was interested in is in, in, in the subjectivity of the surveillance that demand the act of projection on the reality. I mean, there is a scene which was a big discussion, uh, which was what happened, I mean, how to embody this figure that doesn't exist, and in the same time, to understand that it's about, about trying to project on the banality. And this was the moment that we had those images from the car. And we started to discuss, and I was asking, OK, if you're sitting all day in a car watching something that you don't know even what you're watching, in fact. You know, you have to film what you will do. So people spoke about smoking cigarette, and then it's how, in fact, you're getting bored, and you start to whistle. <laughs> and from there comes this thing about you know, the thing which is the gesture itself of being civilian and the fact that the people knew that they are being sur surveyed. This is what's important. This is what's important, which is this thing like we have it today. I mean, every place that have a camera, it's written that there is a camera. The sign that there is a camera, it's more important than the camera itself. You talk about the embodiment of Major B, and I was happy to see the French version because I could hear uh, Hans Sichler. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the German version was Bruno Ganz. Bruno Ganz is doing yeah. the, the German version. Uh, we know Hans Sichler from, of course, with Wenders, but also Godard, uh, mm -hmm. Merville. How did, you, how did he, or how did you ask him to perform uh, this role? <laughs> It was it was difficult. One of the thing is that I wanted to avoid. We wanted to avoid totally the uh, any kind of um, an accent. The idea of the accent. I mean, we took Bruno Grant, which has a neutral accent, a kind of East, but not really East. And there was the question of Tischler that speaks very good French, and. The idea was there is no voiceover. 
This was one. It's not a voiceover. And secondly, why to have two original version in order not to loud an image on an image, I mean the subtitles on the image, which is how you can listen listen to the image without being distracted by a second subtitle. And this was the decision why to have those two versions. But then there was the real question of how to do it. Um, and because we had two incredible actors, so we asked two of both of them to act. And we just recorded, we didn't film. But everything is acted. It's not recorded in a studio. They're walking, I mean, Tishler is walking in the building, is in the building, he's sitting in the chair, he is going into the rooms which are exist in the archive. And everything, and we were shooting during seven days, just the sound with Tischler, and seven days then we did with Bruno Gantz. We had in the very beginning, because we had the translation, Tischler gave us a kind of, just a voiceover in order to edit. But then when we came back, we played everything with them. I mean, we really played. And Tischler had this, something which was funny, and I have one image is that he wanted to play in uniform. He, he wanted to play in uniform, which was that not only I'm playing, there was no camera. If I'm playing, so I'm playing in uniform. So he was walking the building, you know, when there is the stairs, when we are connecting between the shooting and the archives of the stairs. So he is walking down the stairs and we are recording at the same time. It was two actors without camera. Oh, I want to bring up something that perhaps rhymes with uh, the, notion of, of the notion of subjectivity that you brought up. Uh, which is the idea of, of point of view. Uh, you, and, and every interview you keep on insisting that it's, it is necessary to have a point of view in, uh, in cinema, as opposed to the idea of cinema as a kind of window uh, onto the world, and the Brazilian uh, idea. And this reminded me of um, debates around the film that was made and that, that was released at the same time as this film, which was uh, Der Untergang. Do you remember this this article by Wim Wenders? He, he, he criticized the film for not having a, a point of view mm -hmm. and uh, legitimizing itself uh, on account of uh, being based on testimonies, historical accounts, and so forth and so forth. Uh, so, so what is it? Was it, was it? What is a critical point of view for you? What does it consist of? Um, I, why is it so necessary? I think I think that I think that you are saying it, which is to recognize the ability of the perpetrator to become witness. In fact, if we think about the notion of witnessing, it's not the perpetrator. The witness will be the one, the one which which uh, is the passive or the one that was there to see. But it won't be the perpetrator. And for me, the critical take, if you want, which is, I truly believe that if there is a cinema of oppressed is the point of view on the perpetrator when when we say when we when we say the certain way my point of view it doesn't mean i'm speaking about myself it's what i see in front of me and if we think we take the paradigm of 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 of, uh, of domestic uh, violence i mean who bears the duty of memory it's always the oppressed and the victim how you shift the duty of memory and the hold of memory to the perpetrator. And I think this criticality, it's something which is in the core of the West in a certain way, which is the idea that who is, who is in fact the witness? Who is in fact the, the, the witness of the crucifying of, of the Christ is the blind synagogue. It's the Jews that didn't see that he's the Messiah. But even in this relation, this Christic relation, and we spoke about it a few times, which is think about the church and think about the cinema. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. The difference is that in the church, there is, I mean, in the Catholic church, there is this poor guy hanged on the wall suffering for us. And in this documentary cinema, we have the victims that are suffering for us, which are giving to the spectator the feeling of Humanity, if I can be in compassion with the suffering, it means that I'm a good one. And I'm not so interested in reaffirming in front of the spectator our goodness, but it's about an interrogation, which is to what extent, in fact, what B is saying could not be said by a lot of civil servants or uh, 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 cadre, uh, 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 senior managers today in big corporations.
And this, I think, I think that the listening to the perpetrator, not the judgment of the perpetrator, the listening as giving it the status of a witness. I think that this is the criticality. But, but this question of point of view is perhaps even more sensitive when, um, when using images made by per perpetrators and using records uh, mm -hmm. um, of uh, regimes of, of, uh, of oppression and, and oppression and so forth. And then I come back to uh, something else that, that Wim Wenders wrote but 25 years before, that Untergang, about another film about, about Hitler, uh, actually made by the, the guy who wrote mm -hmm. Der Untergang. Well, it was called Hitler, a, a career, I think. Mm -hmm. And there, there he, he said, okay, there, there's always the risk that the fascination with historical images, especially those that le are, were legitimized by the perpetrators, uh, become obstacles for uh, crit critical reflection. Mm -hmm. And he says something in, 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 like, uh, you cannot show something at a certain length if you want to distance yourself from it. Mm -hmm. yeah? So here the question is, becomes one of distance, how to install the necessary distance. Well, this was this was all, this was the question. This was the question about images or immediate images of of actions that can be seen as direct oppression, like the arrest of the woman with the, with the, the kids or the man that is shouting. And there are two examples like this in the film, and nothing else. And by purpose, and there is no the prison, etc. Which means, in a certain way, we can say the victims are not there. If you ask, what is absence? I believe that by excluding, in a certain way, the victim, they become much more apparent. I mean, they are there in permanent because they don't have representation. But you speak about the fascination. I would say, I would say that how you, how you. Um, the um, um, you, you, like the amorce, like a bomb, when you, the, the, the fascination that can be created, for example, to a much shorter appearance of the, of the uh, interrogation. If the interrogation would take a kind of a moment of an event, the two interrogations that in moments of, of event, and it will be just segments, I think that in this regard the fascination will be, and if you see there is a kind of an, it's a very long appearance, which is by purpose, it banalizes itself in a certain moment. It doesn't, it's not an event, it's a de-event. This is maybe the beginning of an answer, which is how, how the material can banalize itself. I mean, confronting Eichmann in segments, it's an event. Letting Eichmann to humanize himself, where is it? Then it creates the what, what Aaron defined in a certain moment, which was this terrifying ordinary person. Terrifying ordinary person. Because what we know about perpetratorship is from fiction cinema, and it's based on the fascination itself. Yeah. And, and this brings up uh, a film which is perhaps the antitype, <laughs> the antitype of, of this film. And it, it's even more, more clear than now that you talk about the eventization, is that even a word? Um, which is, of course, uh, Das Leben der Anderen, which came out which, two, three years after this. Yeah. Well, he's saying that he was inspired from this one. Oh, really? Yeah. He said when he got, um, he got the Grimme, or he got the, he got the important prize, and at that moment he said, huh? he won the Oscars, but it was a discourse in Germany. And he said that he saw this film, and then he was interested to put on scene the person which is absent from this film, which is exactly the return to the fascination. He said that. I mean, he didn't say it like this, but yeah. But if, if you compare them, there's another st striking um, difference. I think it's that historical fictions like uh, Das Leben der Anderen, but also Der Untergang, more and more insist on the factual, uh, more and more make claims of uh, accuracy, uh, of mm -hmm. authenticity, and so forth. While works in the documentary fields, if you can say so, like yours, uh, more and more have the tendency to subvert, to question, to displace truth claims. Uh, how, how do you see these diverging tendencies? Well, I think I think that the, the idea that this is this is that I would say that the trick. The, 
where the fiction is strict in a certain way, which is this necessity to stick to the reality in order, as if, as if facts, I would say it in another way. This is the confusion maybe of the fiction between the notion of fact and reality. It's not because you are factual that you are more real. I mean, there is, we, the paradox of the documentary image that it creates a distance. And this is a this is a paradox which I'm in a way fascinated in, which is we see an actor gaining two million dollars in order. I mean, Meryl Streep gets money in order to die in a film, and we will cry. And we see cadavers in permanent in documentary films, and we won't. What makes what makes that the reality that is inscribed inside the material itself allows us makers to emancipate from it. While the fiction which has the DNA of, let's say, the fake, but in the same time, the very close effect reaction needs the factual in order to what it needs the factual, in order to become what you call this authentic. But this authentic is a pure fake because it's a non-point of view. I mean, the question is just a question of the point of view. You are not giving the point of view to Mr. B. It's not because I will be in his mind that it's I'm joining him. No, this is the way to create the distance. But this is a distance that we, we allow ourselves as documentary that it doesn't jeopardize our relation as spectator to the material, while in a certain fiction world, there is that the authenticity it was old has with, with the screen. To say, I, I just saw a series on HBO, which is... a a series that happens on, on an event, which was this, the, 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 the murdering and burning of a Palestinian boy in 2014. And it's a fiction, but they're so trying to, to, to stick in a, such a precise way to the reality, I would say, sorry, to the facts, that in fact it becomes a kind of a fiction. Because there are, in fact, this systematic thing of being with the facts. And, the facts are not reality. It's the articulation of facts that creates reality. It's a point of view that creates reality on facts. Well, you have always been very critical uh, of the so-called humanistic traditions of documentary, yeah. but perhaps also of fiction. Uh, for example, the, the Slam der Anderen can be seen as a kind of humanistic, even Catholic morality play yeah. about redemption, salvation, exactly. Exactly. Uh, someone achieving grace mm -hmm. uh, through love yeah. and, and art. Yeah. Uh, through music and Brecht, actually, in the, in the film. Um, but what, what, what are the problems with, with humanism in cinema? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Sorry, that... Uh, no, no, I, I, humanism, I, I think... I, I, here we have to come back... Uh, we here we have to come back to, I, I would say, to the very beginning origin of the cinema. I mean, let's... let's uh, and I'm sorry for that, but let's think... Uh, uh, a second together. What is invented is fic it's documentary cinema, right? When we say the invention of cinema, we're talking about documentary. I mean, real actors, I mean, the train is with the real train, the train station of La Ciota is the train station. I mean, in this distinction between fiction and documentary that will be documentary, we're staging with reality and fiction is staging a reality. So the first cinema is documentary cinema. And we have two elements which are fundamental, which will be one, the inscription in the time. We are in time of technology and we are, of the, this is the train. And the second is the coming out from the usine, um, from the factory, from the Lumière factory. So there was said a lot about this fragment of the Lumiere with the workers that are coming out, and there is wonderful work that Faruqi was done, done about it, the question of the working class, etc. But I'm, when I started to be interested in, in the question that you just asked me, was the fact that here we have the owners of a factory that has a camera and have the technique, and what they're doing, they're filming their workers. And here we establish a relation that will be the relation of the documentary cinema, which is the power that is filming the powerless. That will be transformed, that will be transformed into the voicing, the possibility of giving the voice for the powerless. 
which is, this is in a certain way. I mean, we know the tradition. We know the tradition that goes from the Lumiere to the colonial cinema and the Lumiere themselves. What they're doing after they will be doing the serial fragment, they will say the, send their car, camera persons to Palestine because this is the origin and this is the Orient and this is the other and to Latin America because this is the origin and this is this is another kind of the exotic uh, um, the exotic um, world. I think that this will impregnate. This will be the DNA of the documentary cinema. The DNA of the documentary cinema is this relation of power, which is I'm behind the camera, the owner of the factory and the owner of the tool, and I'm filming my workers. Uh, my former colonized, my uh, occupied, and whatever. In this relation, and this is the, the humanist, uh, humanist tradition, which I believe that the documentary plays a fundamental role in creating, I would say, ideolog ideology of otherness, which is the humanistic idea. It's another. It's, of course, we are a part of the same humanity, brother, etc. But it's another. And what's the role of this other one? And this is the, the the problem that I have with the humanistic tradition is that the fact that the victim, the subaltern, the sufferer, the the oppressed. I mean, think about subjects of documentary, what they are about. What's the function of that figure on the screen? And I'm coming back, the function of that figure on the screen is this, what I called, it's the function of the church, but in a secular manner, which is I'm seeing the suffering on the screen, I'm feeling for the suffering one, it's not that they suffer for me, like in the case of the Christ, but it affirms my humanity because I can feel them. And this is the way, which is an affirmation of my position in goodness, or if you want, in white innocence in a certain way. I'm interested in interrogation. I'm interested in putting a question mark on the screen to the spectator. I'm the first one. It is who I am, not who is the other. And I, this is the shift of the camera. This is the perpetrator. This is taking responsibility of my position from where I'm coming from. Of course, I mean, to do Eichmann, to do the Stasi as a continuation, it's as strange as a take. I mean, I could play a victim in those uh, two uh, films, historically, from my personal experience. Someone has questions or responses to this? <clears throat> No? Usually there is one that doesn't agree with me. No, much at, more. At least one. Oh. How did we compose the text of B? The text of B was published. The text of B is an interview that was done with B at the moment in this uh, few months, which is... The dismant before the dismantling of the Stasi in the transformation moment. The interview was done by a priest that was a former informer of B, in a form of a kind of a confession. The priest published it in German, in a small publishing um, house, and it was not very known as a text. It happened to be that Stefan, uh, Svetan Todorov, um, the, cultural uh, uh, thinker, published and com uh, the text in, uh, in French and with uh, commentaries. And then the producer that co-produced the film came with that text. So it was a long text. What we did, we uh, took the text as, as it was, the testimony. And first of all, we took out um, what could be descriptions of places, or for example, I'll give you a very simple example. He's saying in the text, the telephone uh, stopped to ring uh, since uh, two weeks. And in the text, in the film, it's it stopped to ring two weeks, which is because there is a shot into the phone. So what we broke, we took the testimony and we broke it to image and text, in fact. And like that, we started to look for the images also. 
So we reduced the text that was in the beginning something equivalent to two and a half hours to 45 uh, minutes. But it was about taking out the description and the redundancies also. But the text, it's his text. Translated to French. This was one of the reasons of choosing those two actors. Because if you look their own history in what they were playing, I mean, Tischler, the Tischler he is the French Nazi in a lot of cinema, in French uh, cinema. He never played the Stasi officer, right? But Tischler was interested in exactly that figure, which is, I mean, we came through a common understanding with, with uh, Gantz and with Tischler about this idea of the banality of the figure, which is to, to play the banality of the figure, which is, I mean, this is maybe the most difficult thing for any kind of actor when you come and you say, okay, it's just a person. It's just a person. And this what was Tischler and, and it, Tischler and mainly Bruno Gantz that, that for him it was much more difficult to, to play because he had ideas of how, because is 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 the German also relation, he had a projection of that. Which Tischler didn't have at all. I mean, really it was kind of the idea was how to play this, yeah, this person that comes for the last day to this factory or for this company that he loved so much, etc. and it's the end. But it was a week of shooting partially because of that. I mean, the text can be said in two days uh, for a good actor. As a retakes and retakes and retakes. And the, the office was a problem one. The ones inside the car, when he's speaking inside the car, he was inside the car. So we, we didn't shoot only in the building. But it was about how to analyze, and this is why there is all this work that is about the acoustic of the places themselves. So we can finish with the same sentence that finished the film. We will leave others to betray our ideals. <laughs> yeah. How can you live without ideals? Um, okay, thank you all for being here. Um, and uh, let's have drinks and continue our tussle about documentary yes. And, yes. and humanism. Okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.